Hey folks, welcome back. In this video, we're going to go over section 1, i.e. the multiple choice questions from the 2023 SQA National 5 Physics exam paper. Now, there are 25 questions in this section, and I recommend that you try them yourself before looking at these solutions. So let's get into it. Question 1 says the letters X, Y and Z represent missing words from the following passage. Quantities that have both a magnitude and a direction are called X. Two examples of this type of quantity are Y and Z. Which row in the table shows the missing words? Well, to answer this, we need to remember the difference between scalars and vectors. Remember, a scalar quantity has a magnitude or size only, whereas a vector quantity has both a magnitude or size and a direction. So that means we can say quantities that have both a magnitude and a direction are called vectors. So X must be vectors. So our answer is going to be C, D or E here. And then for this one, we need two examples of vectors. For C, we've got energy and mass, which are both scalars. For E, we've got energy, which is a scalar, and force, which is a vector so it can't be that one. And for D we have force and acceleration which are both vectors because when we describe forces and accelerations we need to state directions. So that means our answer here is D. Question 2 says a trolley is released from the top of a slope and passes between two light gates P and Q. The distance between the light gates is D. So there's the two light gates P and Q and there's the trolley with the card of length L. And you can see the distance between the two light gates labelled D. It then says the time taken for the car to pass through light gate P is T1. The time taken for the car to pass through light gate Q is T2. The length of the card in the trolley is L. The instantaneous speed of the trolley at light gate Q is given by. And you can see all of these answers are different expressions for the instantaneous speed, not an actual value. So if we look back at the picture, we want the instantaneous speed of the trolley at light gate Q, further down the slope. Well, firstly, it's useful to remember that instantaneous speed can be calculated using speed distance time, given in the form d equals vt here. Or you can rearrange it for the instantaneous speed v to get v equals d over t, where the distance is the length of the card L and the time is the time taken for the car to pass through the light gate Q, which is time t2. And remember, we were told that in the question. So therefore, we just want to replace the distance and time symbols here with the more specific variables that were given in the question. So that would give us v equals L over t2, where L is the distance here and t2, as we said, was the time for the car to pass through light gate Q. And that means our answer here is d, L over t2. Question 3 says the graph shows how the speed of a runner changes during the last 8.0 seconds of a race. And you can see in the graph here we've got speed in metres per second on the y-axis and time in seconds on the x-axis. It then says the distance travelled during the 8.0 seconds is. Well remember if we've got a speed time graph and we're asked to determine distance, or a velocity time graph and we're asked to determine displacement, then we need to calculate the area under the graph. So we can firstly say that distance is equal to the area under the speed time graph or VT graph. And remember when we're doing this, we want to deal with simple squares like rectangles and triangles. And we always want the area between the solid line and the x-axis. So that's going to be the area between this line here and the x-axis. Remember the dashed lines are just guidelines to show you at what times things are happening. Well, if I want to get rectangles and triangles here, I'm going to split this area into two. So if we put a line across there, you'll see that gives us a rectangle and a triangle. And then I'm going to label the three shapes between the solid line and the x-axis. So I'm going to call this rectangle shape number one. I'm going to call this second rectangle shape number two. And then I'm going to call this triangle shape number three. And then we can put in the expressions for the areas. So we have the area of a rectangle length times spread for shape one, plus the length times spread for shape two, since that's also a rectangle, plus a half times base times height for the area of the triangle here, shape number three. And then we just need to substitute the numbers in from the graph. So for the first rectangle, we've got length is 2.0 times a breadth of 4.0. So we've got 2.0 times 4.0 there. Plus the second rectangle is going from 2.0 to 8.0. So to find the length there, we need to do 8.0 minus 2.0, which gives us 6.0 for that length, times the breadth again of 4.0. So that gives us 6.0. 6.0 times 4.0 there, plus the area of the triangle. So the base of that, remember, is 6.0. So we're doing a half times 6.0 times the height, but it's just this little height here for the triangle, not the full height from the x-axis. So this little height here you'll see goes from 4 to 6, which is a difference of 2.0. So we're doing a half times 6.0 times 2.0. And then you can either do this in your head or put it into your calculator. So 2 times 4 gives you 8, plus 6 times 4 is 24, plus a half times 6 times 2 gives you 6. So in total that gives us 38 metres, which is the answer C. Question 4 says a block is pushed 3.0 metres up a slope by a constant force of 6.0 newtons. So there's the slope which is raised at this point by 0.1 metres in height, and you can see a force of 6.0 newtons is applied to the block to move it up the slope. And we've got that distance labelled there of 3.0 metres. 
then says the force of friction between the block and the slope is 2.0 newtons. The mass of the block is 1.5 kilograms. The work done by the pushing force in moving the block 3.0 meters up the slope is. Well, usually in a question to find work done, you would want to find the unbalanced force F before plugging it into the equation for work done EW equals FD. So to find the unbalanced force here, you would usually do 6 newtons minus the frictional force of 2 newtons. However, the question is asking us here for the work done by the pushing force. So we can say that since we are asked specifically about the pushing force, we do not need to calculate the unbalanced force. That is, we can ignore the force of friction here. So we're just going to ignore this 2.0 newtons and use the 6.0 newtons, that pushing force, as our force F in the equation. So if we then use the work done equation, EW equals FD, we have 6.0 times 3.0 since we're talking about the pushing force of 6.0 newtons and the block is being pushed a distance of 3.0 meters up the slope. So doing that in your head or in a calculator should give you an answer of 18 joules, which gives us the answer D here. Question 5 says a trolley of mass 4.0 kilograms is traveling along a track. The trolley accelerates from 2.0 meters per second to 6.0 meters per second. The increase in kinetic energy of the trolley is. Well, an increase in kinetic energy is the same as saying a gain in kinetic energy, and we can say that the gain in kinetic energy EK is equal to the change in kinetic energy, delta EK. So if we write this change in kinetic energy as EK2 minus EK1, where EK2 just represents the final kinetic energy and EK1 represents the initial kinetic energy, then we can further sub in some expressions here. So we can say this is equal to a half mv2 squared minus a half mv1 squared, where the mass is staying the same for the object, but v2 is the final speed or velocity here, and v1 is the initial speed or velocity. Now you can either plug the numbers straight into here or you could actually factorise this to make it look a bit simpler. So because the v2 and v1 are the only things different in these two expressions and they both have a half m term in there, then we could factorise to take the half m outside the brackets. So we could say this is equal to a half m times v2 squared minus v1 squared. And then all we need to do is sub in the numbers that we've got in the question here. So that's equal to a half times 4.0 for the mass times 6.0 squared for the final speed minus 2.0 squared for the initial speed. Now if you do that in your head or put it into a calculator you should get an answer of 64 joules which gives the answer B. Question 6 is a skills question where we've got an unseen formula and it says the natural greenhouse effect is vital for sustaining life on earth. The no greenhouse temperature is the average surface temperature of earth if there were no natural greenhouse effect. The no greenhouse temperature T can be determined using the relationship T squared equals 280 squared times the square root of 1 minus alpha divided by D squared, where T is the no greenhouse temperature in Kelvin, alpha is the proportion of incoming solar radiation that earth reflects, and D is the mean distance from the sun in astronomical units, AU. The value of alpha for earth is taken to be 0 0.290 and the mean distance from the sun to earth is 1.00 AU. The no greenhouse temperature of earth is... Well, remember with an unseen formula question, all we need to do is start with the equation and plug in the numbers that we've been given, and then try and manipulate the expression to get the variable that you want. So here we want t on its own, and notice how the equation starts with t squared. So that means we're going to have to do a square root in the end. So let's just sub in the numbers straight from the question. So we have t squared equals 280 squared times the square root of 1 minus 0 0.290 over 1.00 squared. Now when you're dividing by 1, that's just the same as this numerator expression itself. And if you put that into your calculator, you should get an answer of t squared equals 66,061.01. Now remember we want t, not t squared, so we're going to have to square root both sides here. So taking the square root of this in your calculator to give you t on its own should give you an answer of t equals 257 Kelvin, which is the answer D. Question 7 says Doris is a small, rocky, irregular shaped object that orbits the Sun between Mars and Jupiter. Doris is an example of A. an asteroid, B. a dwarf planet, C. an exoplanet, D. a planet, or E. a star. Well, if we look at our definitions from the space topic, the one that looks the most like this one in the question is going to be that for the asteroid. So we said in the space topic that asteroids are objects orbiting the Sun that do not fulfill planetary criteria. And here we're told that Doris is a small, rocky, irregular shaped object that orbits the Sun between Mars and Jupiter. Jupiter. So if it's orbiting between two planets, then it's orbiting the Sun, and it doesn't fulfill planetary criteria because it's a small, rocky, irregular shape. So therefore, we can say the answer is A, an asteroid. 
Question 8 says a space vehicle of mass 350 kilograms is free falling vertically towards the surface of Mars. Rocket engines are now fired, which apply a combined upwards force of 2,200 newtons on the vehicle. So there's the space vehicle, and you can see the rocket engines are pushing the gases downwards. And there's the surface of Mars labelled at the bottom. And then it says just after the rocket engines are fired, the vehicle will move away from the surface of Mars at a constant speed, move away from the surface of Mars with an increasing speed, move towards the surface of Mars at a constant speed, move towards the surface of Mars with a decreasing speed, or move towards the surface of Mars with an increasing speed. Well, in order to find out what the vehicle is going to do, we need to work out what the unbalanced force is doing, i.e. in which direction the unbalanced force is acting, as that's going to tell us which way the object is going to move, and if it's going to be speeding up or slowing down. So let's just draw a wee sketch here first of all to help us think about this. Now for this free body diagram, I'm just using a rectangle or a block to represent the vehicle. And we're told in the question that there's a combined upwards force of 2,200 newtons due to the rocket engines. Now remember vertically, there's also going to be a force acting downwards on this vehicle which is its weight. So we could label this on the free body diagram here and we could actually calculate what this weight is going to be. So if we do that we can use W equals mg. We can then substitute in the mass of the vehicle which we're given as 350 kilograms times 3.7 which is the gravitational field strength on Mars. And remember you'll find that value of 3.7 on the data sheet. So if you plug that into a calculator you should get an answer of 1295 newtons. So that means if we've got a force upwards of 2,200 newtons and a force downwards of 1,295 newtons, then we could take the smaller force away from the bigger force to find that the unbalanced force is going to act upwards, and that's going to be a value of 905 newtons. So therefore we can say that an unbalanced force upwards will cause the vehicle to slow down as it approaches the surface of Mars. That is, although the vehicle is acting downwards towards the surface of Mars, because the unbalanced force is acting upwards, it's going to slow down towards the surface of Mars rather than speed up. So that means we can say the vehicle will move towards the surface of Mars with a decreasing speed, which is the answer D. Question 9 says a uniform electric field exists between plates Q and R. The diagram shows the path taken by a particle P as it passes through the field. And you can see particle P bends down the way towards plate R and away from plate Q. It then says which row in the table identifies the charge on particle P, the charge on plate Q and the charge on plate R. Well if we look back at the diagram, because particle P is being attracted towards plate R, then they must be opposite charges, whereas particle P is being repelled away from plate Q, so they must be the same charge. So we need to find an option in the table that has P and R being opposite charges and P and Q being the same charge. And you can see the only option that has P and Q being the same charge is this one E. And we can check also that the charge in particle P is opposite to that on plate R, so that the particle is attracted to plate R. So that gives us the answer E. Question 10 says alternating current AC can be defined as a current where only negative charges move, charges move in one direction only, charges reverse direction at regular intervals, only positive charges move, or the rate of flow of charge is constant. Well remember direct current DC is the one where charges move in one direction only, so we can rule out B there. And remember the definition of alternating current or AC as a current where electrons will change direction every fraction of a second. Or in other words, there's a continuous back and forth flow of current. And the option here which looks most similar to that is this one here, where charges reverse direction at regular intervals. So that means our answer here is C. Question 11 says a circuit is set up as shown. So here we've got a 5 volt battery or DC supply, we've then got an LED and a resistor in series with it. It then says the voltage across the LED is 2.2 volts. The current in the LED is 10.0 milliamps. The resistance of resistor R is. Well, this is a classic LED question where they're giving you data about the LED, but then they're asking you about something else. So here we've got the voltage across the LED and the current passing through the LED, and then we're asked for the resistance of the resistor. So that means we firstly need to calculate the voltage across the resistor. Well, because this is a series circuit, remember the voltages across these components must add up to give the voltage across the battery or the supply. So that means to get the voltage across the resistor, VR, we can say that's equal to the supply voltage, VS, minus the voltage across the LED. So substituting in those numbers, we have 5.0 volts from the supply minus 2.2 volts across the LED, which we're told in the question there. And then I'm sure you can do that in your head to get a value of 2.8 volts. 
Now that we've got the voltage across the resistor, we know the current passing through the resistor is actually the same as the current passing through the LED because we've just got this one path in the series circuit. So we've got our voltage across this resistor and the current flowing through it of 10.0 milliamps. So therefore we can find the resistance. So using the equation V equals IR, where I'm just calling the voltage VR to be more specific to say it's the voltage across the resistor. And we can then divide both sides by I to get R in its own. So we get R equals VR over I. Substituting in the numbers gives 2.8 divided by 10 times 10 to the minus 3, where we're just converting that 10 milliamps into amps there, and then putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 280 ohms. So that gives us the answer D here. Question 12 says a circuit is set up as shown. So we've got this series circuit with a 24 volt battery or supply voltage, and then we've got two resistors in series with a voltmeter across this resistor. And the resistors have resistance values of 1.2 kilo ohms at the bottom and 2.4 kilo ohms at the top. It then says the reading on the voltmeter is. Well, remember when we've got two or more resistors in series like this, it's called a potential divider circuit. And we're asked for the voltage across this lower resistor. And because we know what the supply voltage is here, we can use the equation for potential dividers where the supply voltage is known. So firstly let's just label these two resistors to keep ourselves right. So I'm going to call the lower one at number one and the upper one number two. And then writing down our equation for potential dividers where the supply voltage Vs is known, we have V1 equals R1 over R1 plus R2 times Vs, where I'm using V1 on the left because I'm trying to find the voltage across resistor one. So substituting in our numbers, just converting these resistance values into ohms, we have 1200 for this resistance divided by 1200 there plus 2400 for this resistor times 24 for the supply voltage. Now if you put that into your calculator you should get an answer of 8 volts, which is the answer A. Question 13 says a circuit containing an LDR switches on a motor when the light level drops below a certain value. The resistance of the LDR increases as the light level decreases. Which of the following shows this circuit? Well, firstly, we can say that a light dependent control circuit requires an LDR, i.e. a light dependent resistor and a variable resistor. So that means we can rule out any of the diagrams here that use a thermistor. So that would be options B, D and E. And that leaves us with only two answers, A and C. So you can see A has the LDR at the top and the variable resistor at the bottom, whereas C has the variable resistor at the top and the LDR at the bottom. And then we just need to think about what this is doing here. So we've got a motor being switched on when light level drops below a certain value. So this will be what is called a low light level control circuit. And we can say that a low light level control circuit requires the LDR to be the lower component and the variable resistor to be the upper component, which would be option C. So let's just go through the steps and see if this makes sense. So we're told the first step in the operation of this control circuit, which is the resistance of the LDR increases as the light level decreases. So light level goes down, resistance of the LDR goes up. So if the resistance of this LDR goes up, then the voltage across it must also go up. And if the voltage goes up here, remember the voltage across the lower component is the same as the voltage across the transistor. So if the voltage is increasing here, then the voltage must be increasing increasing across the transistor, which means it's eventually going to reach its switch on voltage and turn on the transistor, which in turn will switch on the motor, which is what we want in this case. If we try to do it with option A, we can see that as light level goes down, the resistance of the LDR goes up. So again, the voltage across this LDR goes up. But remember, because these two components are in a potential divider circuit, then if this LDR at the top takes a bigger share of the supply voltage, then it means this lower component, the variable resistor, will take a lower share of the supply voltage, which means the voltage there is essentially decreasing, so the voltage across the transistor is decreasing. And that means the transistor is unlikely to reach its switch on voltage, and therefore it wouldn't be able to turn on the motor. So option A is not going to work. Options B, D and E had thermistors in them, which means they're not light dependent control circuits, they're temperature dependent control circuits. And that leaves us with option C, which we've just seen makes sense. Question 14 says a slow cooker has a power rating of 250 watts. The slow cooker is switched on for two hours. The energy used by the slow cooker in this time is. Well, here we're given a power and we're given a time and we're asked to calculate energy. So we're going to use our equation for power, energy and time. So that's P equals E over T. We can then multiply both sides by T to get energy on its own. So we get E equals PT. Or you can just sub the numbers in at this stage and rearrange the numbers. So if we plug the numbers in, we get 250 times 2 times 60 times 60 where what we're doing there is changing the two hours into seconds. So we've got two times 60 gets it into minutes, and then times 60 again gets it into seconds. So putting all that into your calculator should give you an answer of 1.8 times 10 to the 6 joules, which is the same as writing 1,800,000, which is answer E here. 
Question 15 says a student investigates the relationship between the power developed in a resistor and the resistance of the resistor. The voltage across the resistor and the temperature of the resistor are kept constant during the investigation. The graph shows the results. So here we've got power in watts on the y-axis and we've got resistance in ohms on the x-axis and you can see we've got this kind of inverse relationship here. So we've got that as resistance goes up, the power goes down. It then says the voltage across the resistor is. Well, because we've got a graph showing us the relationship between power and resistance and we're asked to calculate voltage, then we need to think about using the relationship between power, voltage and resistance. But obviously we're not given individual values for the power and the resistance to calculate the voltage, so we need to choose values from the graph ourselves. So an easy point to choose here on the curve would be something like 2 along and 2 up, so this point here. So I'm just going to put a wee cross there to show that's the point we're using. But you don't have to use this point, you could use say 3 along and 1.4 up, so you could use 3 ohms for the resistance and 1.4 watts. Or you could use this point here, 5 along and 0.8 up, so that's 5 ohms and 0.8 watts, and you should get the same answer. So using this point, we can say to choose a point on the curve, for example the point 2, 2, and then using the equation P equals V squared over R, we can rearrange for V squared to get V squared equals P times R, so just multiplying both sides by R here. And then if we do that with our two points, we have 2 times 2, which gives 4. And then to get V on its own, we need to take the square root of both sides. So we have V equals the square root of 4, which is 2.0 volts. And that means we have the answer C here. Question 16 says a student carries out an experiment to determine the specific heat capacity of copper using the apparatus shown. So we've got a power supply connected to the joule meter and an electrical heater connected to the joule meter as well. And the heater and this thermometer are placed into a block of copper. It then says the student switches on the power supply and the electrical heater heats the block of copper. The joule meter measures the energy supplied to the electrical heater. The student suggests the following measurements should also be made. So statement 1 says the mass of the block of copper, statement 2 says the initial and final readings on the thermometer, and statement 3 says the power rating of the electrical heater. Then says which of these measurements must be made to determine the specific heat capacity of copper. So let's think about the equation used to calculate specific heat capacity, which is EH equals CM delta T. So we've got heat energy, specific heat capacity C, the mass M of the material, and the change in temperature of the material. So if we divide both sides by M times delta T here, then we can get an expression for C on its own, which is C equals EH over M delta T. So you can see that if you were carrying out this experiment to determine the specific heat capacity C, you would need to know the heat energy EH, the mass of the copper block, and the change in temperature. So if we look back at the statements, statement 1, the mass of the block of copper, that would be this M here, so that is needed to calculate C. So we can give that one a tick. For statement 2, the initial and final readings on the thermometer, well knowing the initial and final temperature would allow us to find the change in temperature delta T, because we could take the lower temperature away from the higher temperature since the block is increasing in temperature here. So that means that second statement is also true because we'd need this delta T value. And lastly, statement 3, the power rating of the electrical heater. Well, you can see we've not got power in this equation, we've got heat energy EH instead. So what we would actually want is the energy supplied to the heater, which can be found from the joule meter in the experimental setup, but that's not mentioned. So that means we can say this third statement is false. So that means we have statements 1 and 2 only being correct, which gives us the answer C. Question 17 says the minimum energy required to melt 3.5 kilograms of ice at its melting point into water at the same temperature is. Well, notice how we're talking about melting here, and another word for melting in the properties of matter topic was fusion. So we're talking about fusion here, which means we're going to do a calculation using the specific latent heat of fusion. So remember the equation to find heat energy is EH equals ML, where I'm using LF here, the little subscript F to represent fusion. And that's just so that I make sure I use the right value from the data sheet. Now we're simply just trying to find EH here, so substituting in the numbers gives 3.5 for the mass times 3.34 times 10 to the 5, which is the value for latent heat of fusion of water from the data sheet. Now make sure you're using the fusion value and not the one for latent heat of vaporization. Lastly, putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 1.2 times 10 to the 6 joules, which gives us the answer B. Question 18 says a hammer hits a nail with a force of 5.0 kN. The pressure exerted by the hammer on the nail is 2.0 times 10 to the 8 pascals. The area of the nail hit by the hammer is. Well, we've got a force and a pressure here and we're asked to calculate area, so we're going to use the equation P equals F over A, pressure equals force divided by area. And we want to calculate area. So you can either substitute the numbers into this and then rearrange the numbers, or you can rearrange for A first. So if you rearrange for A first, you can times both sides by A and then divide by P, or just cross multiply, which is the same as swapping these two terms round. So we end up with A equals F over P, 
force divided by pressure. And then substituting in the numbers, we have 5.0 times 10 to the 3, where we're converting the kilonewtons into newtons there, and dividing by 2.0 times 10 to the 8, which is the pressure. So putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 2.5 times 10 to the minus 5 meters squared, which is the answer B. Question 19 says a sealed hollow buoy drifts from warm Atlantic waters into colder Arctic waters. The volume of the buoy remains constant. The pressure of the trapped air inside the buoy changes because pressure is directly proportional to the temperature in Kelvin, inversely proportional to the temperature in Kelvin, inversely proportional to the volume of the air inside the buoy, inversely proportional to the temperature in degrees Celsius, or directly proportional to the temperature in degrees Celsius. Well, because we've got volume staying constant, that means if pressure changes, temperature is going to change. And this is related to Gay-Lussac's law, which is the pressure temperature law. And this states in symbol form that pressure is directly proportional to temperature in Kelvin. And remember, all that means is that if the temperature of the gas inside the buoy increases, then the pressure in the gas also increases. Or the opposite is true as well. So if temperature decreases, then the pressure decreases as well. And remember, temperature must be in Kelvin. And therefore, the answer here must be A, that pressure is directly proportional to the temperature in Kelvin. Question 20 says the pressure of a fixed mass of gas is 5.0 times 10 to the 5 pascals. The temperature of the gas is 320 Kelvin and the volume of the gas is 2.2 meters cubed. The gas is then heated to a temperature of 370 Kelvin and the pressure of the gas increases to 5.5 times 10 to the 5 pascals. The new volume of the gas is. Well notice here how we've got pressure, temperature and volume all changing. So we've got none of the variables pressure, volume or temperature being kept constant. So that means we need to use the general gas equation here. So we have P1 V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2, where remember temperature is in Kelvin. But that's okay because we've already got temperatures in Kelvin in the question. So we're trying to find the new volume of the gas here, which is V2. So let's sub in the numbers for everything else. So we have 5.0 times 10 to the 5 for the initial pressure, times 2.2 for the initial volume, divided by 320 Kelvin for the initial temperature. And that's equal to 5.5 times 10 to the 5 for the final pressure, times V2, which we're trying to find, divided by 370 Kelvin, which is the final temperature. Now because we've just got numbers purely on this left hand side, let's just plug that into the calculator and see what we get. So if you do that, you should get 3437.5 and then that's equal to the same right hand side here. So we have 5.5 times 10 to the 5 times V2 divided by 370. So that just makes it look a wee bit simpler straight away. Now what I'm going to do is cross multiply. So this on its own is the same as being divided by 1, which means if we thought about that as a fraction, it's technically on the numerator on this side. So we can times this by the 370 and make that equal to this numerator here. So if we do that and then just take this over to the left, we have 5.5 times 10 to the 5 V2, which is just the numerator there, is equal to this 370 times 3437.5. And if you put that into your calculator, you should get this value of 1271875. Lastly, to find V2 on its own, we need to just take this answer and then divide it by 5.5 times 10 to the 5, which should give you an answer in your calculator of 2.3 meters cubed, which is the answer C. Question 21 says the diagram represents a wave. So we have the distance from this crest to this crest labelled 12 metres, and we have this full vertical height labelled 0.4 metres. Then says the speed of the wave is 3.0 metres per second. Which row in the table shows the amplitude and frequency of this wave? Well, to find amplitude, first of all, we need to remember what amplitude actually is on a wave diagram. So remember, amplitude is defined as half the vertical height of the wave. So if that's the full vertical height of 0.4 metres, then half the vertical height must be half of that value. Or another way to think about it is it's the distance from the crest to the axis, which is this dashed line through the middle of the wave, or the distance from the trough to the axis, this distance here. So it's going to be half of this value. So we can say amplitude equals 0.4 divided by 2, which equals 0.2 meters. So that means our answer is going to be A, B or C here, and we can rule out D and E. Then to find the frequency, notice how we're given speed and we're given some information which could help us find the wavelength. So let's find the wavelength and then we'll have the wavelength and the speed in order to calculate the frequency using V equals F lambda. So we've got the distance from this crest to this crest is 12 meters, but remember wavelength is defined as the horizontal distance from one crest to the next crest. So that would be this distance here. So because we've got 12 meters to there, we're just going to use half of that distance to get to this crest, which means we can say our wavelength lambda equals 12 divided by 2, which equals 6 meters. So now that we have our wavelength of 6 meters and a speed of 3.0 meters per second, we can calculate the frequency. So using V equals F lambda, we can rearrange for F by dividing both sides by lambda to get F equals V over lambda 
lambda, substituting in the numbers gives 3.0 divided by 6, and doing that in your head gives you an answer of 0.50 Hz. So with an amplitude of 0.2 meters and a frequency of 0.50 Hz, that gives us the answer B here. Question 22 says which diagram shows the diffraction of water waves as they pass through a gap in a barrier? Well notice how the diagrams look exactly the same for each option on the left hand side, it's only different where the waves have passed through the barrier on the right hand side. And notice in each diagram how we've got a fairly large gap in each one. So we can say first of all that for a large gap the water waves will bend slightly at the edges but the middle of the waves will remain straight. And that's because remember the larger the gap the smaller the diffraction, i.e. waves will bend less for a larger gap. And we can say the opposite is true as well, so the smaller the gap, the more diffraction, the more bending of the waves. So that means we can rule out diagrams like A and D because those show quite a lot of bending there. We can then see that option B doesn't show any curving at the edges, so we can rule that one out. And lastly for option C we see these waves with curves on one end, which is what we would see for waves passing around an object or an obstacle like a wall, not through a gap. So that leaves us with option E, which is what is mentioned in the description here. We've got the middle of the waves remaining straight and it's just the edges that are curving slightly. And lastly notice that the spacing between the wave fronts is the same, i.e. the wavelength remains constant. And that's another reason why we could rule out option A, because you can see that the wavelength decreases, the crests of the waves there get more bunched up as they've passed through the barrier, which just wouldn't happen. So therefore we can say the answer here is E. Question 23 says a ray of red light passes through a glass block as shown. So there's the ray of red light passing from glass into air, and it says which ray shows the path of the red light in air? Well remember this dashed line is the normal at 90 degrees to this surface, and it helps to remember here that as light passes from a denser material like glass to a less dense material like air, it bends away from the normal. So because the light's not passing along the normal, it's not going to be ray Q, the light's not just going to pass straight through, because this edge isn't completely vertical. But a wave that does show bending away from the normal is ray P. And because the glass block is shaped in this way, the light's going to come out on this side of the normal, not on this side. Because notice how the instant ray is below the normal here, and these rays are all below the normal again. And that's something we don't see in ray diagrams. So we've got a ray below the normal there, and then it's above the normal there. So therefore our answer is ray P, which is option A. Question 24 says a sample of uranium has an activity of 2.4 times 10 to the 4 becquerels. The number of nuclei decaying in 15 minutes is. Well here we're given activity and time and we're asked to calculate number of decays, so we're going to use the equation A equals N over T from the radiation topic. So you can either substitute the numbers straight in now, or you can rearrange for N first. So if we multiply both sides by T to get N on its own, we get N equals A times T. Substituting in the numbers gives 2.4 times 10 to the 4 times 15 times 60, where what I'm doing there is converting 15 minutes into seconds, so we need to times by 60, and putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 2.2 times 10 to the 7. And remember there's no units because it's a number, so that gives us the answer E here. Lastly, question 25 says a student makes the following statements about nuclear fusion. Statement 1 says nuclear fusion is when a large nucleus splits into smaller nuclei. Statement 2 says plasma containment is required to sustain nuclear fusion reactions in a reactor. And lastly, statement 3 says nuclear fusion takes place at low temperatures. Which of these statements is or are correct? Well, let's go through each statement in turn and decide which ones are true or false. So the first one there, nuclear fusion is when a large nucleus splits into smaller nuclei. Well that's false because remember that is describing nuclear fission, which is your larger nucleus splitting into two or more fission fragments, and usually neutrons are also released. Whereas nuclear fusion is the joining together of smaller nuclei to form a larger nucleus, again with energy being released. For statement 2, plasma containment is required to sustain nuclear fusion reactions in a reactor. Well that is true because remember plasma containment is one of the major challenges of nuclear fusion, where strong magnetic fields are required to contain plasma inside the nuclear reactor. Otherwise if the plasma touches the parts of the reactor it's going to cool down and the reaction will stop, or it's going to melt parts of the reactor. Lastly, statement 3 says nuclear fusion takes place at low temperatures. Well, they did try that in the past, but it wasn't successful. So nuclear fusion is only carried out at high temperatures now, because temperatures need to be high enough for plasma to exist. So that last statement must be false. So therefore, statement 2 is the only correct one here, which means we can say it's 2 only, which is B. That's all for this video folks, thanks for watching. If you made it to the end, I really appreciate it. Make sure to give the video a like, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.